Our text this morning is Psalm 127, verses 4 and 5. Psalm 127, 4 and 5. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Beloved, what are children? There are many words that are used for children. You'll recognize them. Children are a nuisance. Children are a burden. Children are an expense. Children, many children, some would say, are brats. These words are ungodly, unbelieving words and worldly evaluations of children. What must the Christian taught by God's word think of children and more specifically now the children of believers the reformed believer in considering the subject of children thinks first of all of this one word the covenant for he has been taught of God that our children are covenant children this is the doctrine of Genesis 17, spoken to Father Abraham, the father of us all, in the New Testament as well as in the Old. I quote, I, the Lord God is speaking, will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed, after thee. There are other key words for covenant children mentioned or suggested in Psalm 127. This psalm refers to children as a blessing, <clears throat> as the gift of God. Gift, blessing. Verse 3 mentions heritage or inheritance and a reward we think we're going to leave our children inheritances God says to us that's true enough but your children are an inheritance given to you from me we think we reward our children and we do but God says I give you children as a reward verse 3 states no children are an heritage inheritance of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward so Christian children then are a divine gift and blessing to us an inheritance and a reward in our unbelief we often struggle to think of our children with the mind of Jesus Christ but then there's another word in this passage, even more neglected, because it doesn't occur that frequently. Another word for children. Children are arrows. Verse 4 states, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Have we ever thought then, of our children or the children that God may be pleased to give to us in years to come or weeks to come as arrows children as blessing heritage gift reward and arrows an arrow of God an arrow that God gives to us by placing that arrow in the quiver of his parents. Let's consider then this morning together children as arrows. Noting first that they are prepared arrows 
powerful arrows and blessed arrows. Children as prepared and powerful and blessed arrows. Now right at the start though we need to say which children are arrows because not all children are arrows. That is arrows blessed of God and serviceable in his kingdom. The reprobate unbelieving children of unbelievers are not arrows. For according to the second commandment, God visits the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Thankfully, though, God saves some of the children of all believers too by grace. Such children who are ungodly born to unbelieving parents are not a sign of God's love and favor to those parents because the scripture teaches in Proverbs 3.33 that the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked and in every room in the house in the kitchen, in the living room in your own bedroom, in the bedroom of your children wherever you may be because mankind is fearful of God, wicked, wretched God visits law breaking with his curse. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Now believers have children, some of whom do not believe and perish and break our hearts. And these children of believers are physical. See, they're not arrows either. Esau wasn't an arrow. To Isaac and Rebekah, we read that he was, quote, a grief of mind to them. They prayed, they wept, and he brought nothing but sorrow and misery to his godly parents. If you think of godly King David, I'll just mention two of his sons. Amnon, one of his sons, was a rapist. He wasn't an arrow. And then Absalom, another one of his sons, killed his half-brother, Amnon, fratricide in the royal palace. They weren't arrows either. <clears throat> but we're dealing here with the elect children of believers. They are the ones called arrows in our text. This is the perspective of Psalm 127. It deals with the children of believers from the organic viewpoint and from the perspective of God's election. This is what we pray regarding the children here and the children yet to be born. They would be arrows. Now there are, of course, many instruments of war. Spears, thinking of Old Testament days, and swords and whatnot. But here, none of those images are used, but arrow is the idea. Now an arrow is a precision instrument. It can just hit one place, one spot. And in making such a precision instrument, you can only use certain types of wood. They alone will serve for the shaft. The shaft must also be straight, obviously not. Typically, we think of a head or a tip of metal which must be attached and then feathers at the back to aid the flight. Now of themselves, even the elect and believing children of God's people are not like this. Of themselves, they are born, as we are, with original sin. All of us are guilty in Adam. He was our representative, and when he fell, we fell in him. And because of our guilt in Adam, God judged us by inflicting the great punishment upon the human race, namely, causing us all to be born totally depraved, as the 
psalmist puts it, we go astray from the womb speaking lies. We can't believe in Jesus Christ. We love darkness rather than light. You can't make natural arrows out of such ungodly materials. So though little babies are undoubtedly very cute, that's right and proper to find them cute, we always understand that they are infected with sin and pollution like us, and but for all but for God's grace, like us too, they stand liable to eternal punishment. So our children of themselves are totally unfitted to be arrows in the hands of a mighty man. They're not the right sort of wood. They're filled with knots and they're dreadfully crooked. But God's grace fashions them into arrows. He straightens them. That's a process. He sharpens them into a point. And the word for arrow especially carries the idea of sharpness. This sharpening and straightening process is God's sovereign, irresistible grace operative in our covenant seed. Now obviously, parents have a vital, difficult, many year long role in the preparation of their children as arrows. And you can think here of the many scripture texts that bring before us our duty with respect to our seed. Ephesians 6 calls us to bring up our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. We train our children to reverence and adore God and we admonish them in love to walk in the right way and to flee from evil. Proverb tells us, train up a child in the way that he shall go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. We train our children. You don't just leave your back garden to grow wild and think it's going to turn out lovely. You don't leave your children to guide. You train them conscious, deliberate work of directing their paths. And we admonish and train our children as arrows. We view them that way that must be shaped. Parents mold their children by instruction. Here, classic passage is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. <laughs> Previous two verses exhort us to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and might. Words that Christ quotes in the text. For the Lord our God is one Lord, and one Lord requires our one whole heart. Then it adds, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, so that thou teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. We teach our children as we pray with them, and lead them in family devotions as they get bigger, and on every occasion that lawfully presents itself. Along with this instruction, as you know, there goes physical correction in love, which helps, by God's blessing, to straighten those arrows just a little bit more. This is an important thing to mention in our day because of the evolutionary secular humanist notions on the rearing of children which are totally erroneous. If you believe that your child is a bald slime and a developed monkey, well then there's an excuse for you to get it wrong in thinking and how we ought to behave. Our children just never physically chastise them. But as Christians who share the wisdom of Jesus Christ, we believe that physical correction and love is necessary on occasion. I'll quote to you the book of Proverbs. Withhold not correction for the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. 
He may tell you to die in Berlin. He's not really going to die. We're not dealing with brutality here. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs 23. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. How true. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. But if you believe like the humanists that we're all born good, then you see physical correction doesn't make sense. But the biblical doctrine of total depravity and love for your children, seeking to bring them up in the fear of admonition of the Lord, that fits. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Because you're teaching your son, see, that your sins don't matter, and that I as your parents are not interested in your woes, you just go on whatever way you like. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes or promptly. And of course, as God works with your child, you probably have to do it less and less. And when your child is properly trained, maybe just a look or a word will be enough. Because God works in them to love Christ, and they don't want to grieve their parents or walk from the truth. Here again, the rod and reproof give wisdom. Not just the reproof of or not just the rod alone, but the rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. We see that with shameful behaviour of young people in our schools and on the streets. God promises too that this will work. The rod and reproof. And if your child is not being straightened by loving Christian discipline, then ordinarily there's something wrong with your discipline. Maybe the discipline doesn't really hurt or sting the child so that the child disregards it. We all remember when we were kids, I used to do it, I would yell and howl as if I was being greatly hurt and then grin to myself when daddy left the room. Then too, when we discipline our children, we must do it promptly so that the child especially learns to associate the sin with chastisement, an appropriate chastisement, a minister of love. You explain that to the child too. And then we seek to discipline our children consistently. Otherwise, the children learn that the parents are not really serious about nurturing him. Discipline too must be done in tandem because, you can remember this I dare say, the, parent, the children are very clever to notice when their parents are not operating together. So that one of the two, they can quickly spot it, is the softer touch. This typically involves parents sitting down together, thinking, talking together about discipline so that they discipline their children for sins. Then, of course, the fathers, strangely enough, are often the most sensitive and kind, need to make it clear that they enforce the loving covenant discipline and they don't undermine the wives, which frustrates the daylights out of them. As I said, it must be done with proper scriptural explanation, the rod and the proof give wisdom. And in our training of children, though this is very difficult, we seek to remember that the child is God's child and that God tells us how he wants us to discipline his children. He says in effect, my child I place in your family for let's say 18 years so that you care for, provide, love, and admonish this child as my representative. And I promise too, with your elect column seed, that I will make this instruction and admonition that you give effectual in them, and make them little arrows fashioned for service in the kingdom of heaven. And not just the parents, but also the church has a vital role in preparing little arrows, which of course become big arrows in time. The means of grace are placed by God and dispensed by the church. 
Baptism is a means of grace to the common sea. Catechism is the official work of preaching. Preaching, of course, is the chief means of grace. Catechism, then, is specifically directed to Christ's little ones. So the Christian parents see to it that they send their children to the catechism because they care for it and want all the help and assistance that they can get. Then, too, the parents go over the child's lesson and send them to class prepared. Yeah. And, of course, this is hard work for the parents. Sometimes it's harder work for the parents, you think, than for the children to help the child to get a hold of the biblical teaching. Those teaching sticks with them, changes them from within, fashions and fits them as ours. The church also prays for the covenant children, typically does it, I would dare say, in congregational prayer, for instance. And the church holds before the members of Christ their calling in all spheres, and not particularly their calling on rearing their children in God's fear and admonition, because the church also has a stake in the little arrows, because the little arrows grow up and then they become parents and confessing members of the congregation of Christ. Remember too that the Christian parent, especially the father, is likened in our text to a mighty man or a warrior. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And a warrior going into battle does not want weak and defective arrows any more than he wants a broken sword. And he sees to it as any self-respecting soldier that he has good arrows because his life may depend upon it. And so the Christian father sees to it that the devotional life of the home is not haphazard, that the Bible reading and prayer is not irregular, the church services are not skipped, and that you're there, where possible, twice each Lord's Day and that the children are not ill-prepared for catechism. Because the Christian parent, and specifically and especially he as a father, is one who first of all has disciplined himself. And only as one who's disciplined himself is he able to discipline and train his children. But arrows not only need to be prepared, they must also be aimed correctly. The Christian father and mother, as warriors in God's kingdom, have aims for their children. Parents automatically have aims for their children. The aim of Christian parents for their children is not that their children be rich, though ordinarily we want our children to prosper and have sufficient to support themselves and help the kingdom of Christ. We don't even aim necessarily that our children be successful, at least in the way that the world judges it and evaluates. We don't seek these things for our children, not because we're training our children to be some sort of losers, but because we judge these evaluations to be too low, because we have too high regard for our children. And we want something better for our children than merely these things. The Christian parent has as his or her goal for their children the glory of the triune God revealed in Jesus Christ. For this is the chief end of man, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And we teach our children too. This is our purpose for you. This is what we want you to do. And if you, by God's grace, fulfill this calling, we will be pleased with you and proud of you in good sense. We want our children to be godly. We want our children to know the scriptures. We want our children to grow up to confess their faith with a sincere heart, to live all their days as faithful members of a solid, reformed church, to bring honor 
to the Creator and Lord of the universe who sent His only begotten Son to die for them. And then we tell them, in this, you must be a faithful student at school, you must honor your parents, you must in turn be a godly spouse, if that's the Lord's will for you, and train your children in the fear of God. And in this calling, you will be training them to have a job and to work, not as a man pleaser in your workplace, to prepare and care for your family and to have something to give to those who are in need. It's a sad thing. This is the world forcing upon us, making life difficult for us, as it always does, that we can be deflected from the supreme calling we have as common parents, rarely thinking of the true goal or aim for our children. Thinking merely and hoping and training our children like those who don't believe in Jesus Christ and are without hope two or three doors down the street. Not telling our children that they must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things in the context that all these other things are food and drink and shelter and clothing and all these other things will be added onto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will take care of itself. You go to job interviews, you work hard First comes the kingdom of God, and then you work and are educated with that goal in mind. Then, too, when children aren't properly instructed this way, they typically won't seek the kingdom of God at all or first. Then, typically, they will leave faithful churches or fellowships and go to departing in liberal churches. Or nowhere at all. This psalm speaks of the godly child as an arrow of the Lord. The arrow of the Lord, then, properly prepared and aimed, seeking God's glory in the kingdom of heaven, is a powerful weapon. Spears, javelins, swords are mentioned in the Old Testament as is especially in one instance, though not exclusively, the sling. Just think of David and Goliath. There's a weapon for a particular task. Now the arrow has of course peculiar advantages, largely unseen, just a blur, and then bang. That's even if you're looking in the right direction. The arrow flies swiftly, it has a much longer range than a javelin. And used by a skilled archer, an arrow can be particularly accurate and penetrating. It's a powerful weapon. In the pages of the Bible, there are various famous men who died of arrow wounds. Uriah the Hittite, an Israelite indeed, though he ethnically was a Hittite. Ahab, that ungodly king. Josiah, the tender-hearted king. They died of arrow wounds. Even King Saul, his death, breaking the sixth commandment and committing suicide, his death was occasioned by an arrow wound on Mount Gilboa in 1 Samuel 31. Now the passage explains in which one way in which children were arrows in Old Testament days. Happy, verse 5 begins, is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now the gate, the gate of the city in the scripture, is used either with respect to the defense of the city militarily, because the gates are the weakest point, if you can force the gate, then, then you're in. Or, the gate is the place of business or legal matters. So, the businessmen or the law courts would meet at the city gates because they were places 
of concourse. That's what happens in Ruth chapter 4 with the marriage of Ruth and the legal uh, affairs involved in that union between her and Boaz. So they will speak with the enemy in the gate. Now maybe the speaking means we're going to speaking of war. But I suggest to you, and you can weigh this for yourself, here speaking suggests to suggests more the legal courts or the business affairs at the gates. And then these enemies would be the ungodly who are trying to do you down or defraud you of your rights. And a man with some strapping sons, godly sons, motivated by justice and care for their parents, such children are very useful if you are being brought unjustly before the courts in Old Testament Israel as it would be departing. Flanked with this impressive phalanx of sturdy sons, you will be no pushover. The ungodly will think twice before they defraud you. Now how does all this apply to us today? Well there is no doubt that godly children help their parents in many ways especially as they grow older and take more and more responsibilities in the home. They can help you by working around the house. They can help you too in old age. They give you company. They enrich your home. Though there are more work, that's undoubtedly the case, they make life a lot more pleasant and enjoyable on your family holidays and such like. But this passage deals with godly children as arrows and powerful weapons, particularly in the kingdom of God. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength or praise, Psalm 8, quoted by Christ in his Passion Week. Children praise God, and God is as interested in the praise of those under 16 as he is in those over 60 or under 60. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. God also hears the prayers of all of his people. And God is no respecter of persons such that he hears the prayers of children too, maybe even more. And Jesus said, if two or of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And there are no age limitations there. It doesn't say of two of you in their twenties or more. Two of you. Our children too are trained to witness, to declare the worship of Almighty God, to speak of Jesus Christ, to save them from their sins, to become in due time mighty in the Word of God, quoting the Scriptures, understanding its message, so that they are able, by God's grace, thereby to pull down strongholds, unbelieving thought, take every thought captive for Jesus Christ. What is your chief end? to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Now in this psalm, Psalm 127, Solomon's mentioned in the heading, Solomon is speaking of the Lord's building, the Lord's building the house, the Lord's keeping the city. And God builds His house, the church, and His city, the city of God, which is the church, in part by the children of believers. And God keeps the city, the spiritual Jerusalem in the New Testament, in part by the children of believers. Jesus Christ promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Jesus Christ builds and preserves his church from the gates of hell by the covenant children of believers. 
And this is the glory of the church in her generations and in her Catholicity. So if you have grandparents, their children, and their grandchildren worshiping together. And covenant children, as members of the church, are used in the church's growth and defense because they too are members in the church militant. Militant means like soldiers, fighting. Not fighting now with external weapons, but fighting the spiritual warfare with the word of God against the kingdom of darkness. The children fight in the church, not amongst each other now, some brawl next door, but they fight in the church and for the church. And first of all, our children, like ourselves, fight against their own sins. And then against the enemies of the kingdom of God. And they do that, not by the flesh, but by prayer and the word of God. And the children in the church fight according to the directions given them by their parents, and more especially their fathers as the heads of the home. And that too is part of the training of children by their parents to fight the battles of the Lord. Parents help their children to identify for them the enemy who's not enemy. They equip their children to fight for Christ and they deploy their children as arrows in the Lord's army. An arrow of the parents, an arrow of the church, an arrow of God. This language about children as arrows is connected with a reference to the arrow of God. God speaks of his incarnate son, Jesus Christ, his child, as an arrow. This is Isaiah 49, verse 2. Prophecy of the coming Savior. Isaiah 49, verse 2, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the one speaking here, by the way. In the shadow of his hand hath God hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. What do you put in the quiver? An arrow. You take the quiver out, you take the arrow out of the quiver and put the arrow in the shadow of your hand, you fit it to the bow. And then there's a polished shaft and God uses that arrow. Jesus Christ. God sent his son into the world as a powerful arrow. That's the perspective of Isaiah 49 verse 2. An arrow that slew Satan. An arrow that hit him in his heart. Or to use another image that crushed his head. An arrow that destroyed the kingdom of darkness. An arrow which was shot from God out of heaven. An arrow which died for our sins on the cross according to God's will. And the grace of God, blessing, parental, and church instruction conforms covenant children to God's arrow. I have a son. I made him an arrow. Make your sons, my sons, arrows too. And then, to quote Jeremiah 50, verse 9, our arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None of them shall return in vain. That is, all of them shall hit their target. That's the difficult, though blessed calling of Christian parents and of the whole church to prepare arrows. And then to pull back the bowstring, to take aim, and to shoot not at each other, but to shoot at the Lord's enemies. These are arrows that can be used time and time again. You won't leave them on the battlefield. You'll bring them back and employ them more than one occasion. And happy is the man that hath his quiver full of such arrows. Verse 5 states, Happy, blessed, rich, and content is the Christian 
to whom God gives covenant seed. Blessed and happy is the Christian to whom God gives these children as ours. Happy is the Christian who not only has these children for company, and that's a great blessing of God, and to play with them and to love them, that too, but especially that God has given me, us children, members of this church, church mountain, to fight his battles. Think of how blessed Jesse was. Jesse had an arrow. One arrow especially was very sharp. David, he fought the wars of the Lord. Elijah's parents, we don't read it in the Bible, but obviously he had parents, he had to have parents. They were blessed with a son like that. Amram and Jochebed in the book of Exodus had three arrows. Two male arrows, Aaron, Moses, and the female arrow, Miriam. Or in New Testament church history, Monica, the father of the mother of Augustine, fashioned an arrow and taught the truth of God's Son of Grace, to whom the church is greatly indebted even today. And blessed or happy is the Christian who has his arrow full of, has his quiver full of such arrows. And so we pray, according to thy will, Father, give us the blessing of more Christian children. Give us the blessing even of large Christian families, his precious arrows. A lot of work, but a gift and heritage of the Lord. You see, too, how far from this thought world of the biblical and reformed faith is the worldly practice of birth control and abortion. It doesn't make much sense for us to say, Lord, I believe the scriptures. I believe children are your heritage that you give to us, but I don't want too big an inheritance. I never heard anybody say they didn't want to be a parent. Lord, I believe the children are a reward, but just don't give me too much of a reward. I believe the children, having children is blessed, but don't make me too happy. I believe children, I believe, Lord, that children are mighty weapons, but I don't want to be armed too well. I want to come into battle sort of scantily clad. I don't want my church to be too well fortified. I don't want the kingdom too well strengthened, but I do believe that they're mighty weapons. It doesn't really make sense. It's two different thought worlds there. And this doctrine of the covenant, the truth of Psalm 127, militates, that is, fights against the notion that we kill our children or we try and stop having children through unbelieving attitudes. This is a doctrine then which guards us, preserves us against the currents of worldly thinking out there that protects the church. And we sing these psalms too. We sing these psalms. We sing these psalms, including Psalms 127 and 28, which talk of the blessedness of the home and the care of the children, as songs of degrees, as songs of pilgrimage, when we go up in public worship to praise the Lord together. This Psalm 127 mentions Solomon, the wisest man in all the earth. He understood about children. He wrote a book, especially for children and their parents, Proverbs. And this is a book, this is a Psalm which teaches us about true blessedness. We want that blessing. We want, by God's grace, children like ours, like Christ, the incarnate Son, to fight the battles of the kingdom of heaven. Grant us, Lord, such children, such parents, such churches. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God of grace, we thank thee for thy word. We know that the entrance of thy word gives light, and it is a torch to lighten our path. Guide us, Father, according to it, that we may run swiftly in the way of all thy commands. For we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.